about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, something like that, I had a really unique experience for me in my life. Uh, let me tell you what happened. But before I can really go there, I, I need to back up a couple of months. A couple months ago, I made a new friend. Uh, his name is Wade Allen. Wade is the senior minister at the Church of Christ in Grissom. Uh, he was here, uh, I think, to see Charlie or something like that. And his daughter and, and my two kids were here at the same time. They played together and, you know, they both, or they all three of them got along really well. So Wade proposed we did a play date and he and I got to know each other. We became really, really fast friends and got to know each other a lot because we've had very similar experiences in ministry and uh, have a very similar sense of humor, which is terrifying. Um, but it's the case. Uh, Wade is not only the senior minister at the Church of Christ in Grissom, but he is also a part-time professor for Louisville Bible College. Um, it sounds more impressive than what it really is. By part-time, I mean he teaches one class and it's over Zoom and there's like five or six people involved. So it sounds really impressive, but you know, what are you going to do? I, I, I called Wade this week to tell him I was going to say that and he said it was okay. So I'm not offending him. Uh, but Wade uh, had a conflict uh, for his usual meeting time for his class, and so he asked me, me, if I would fill in for him. Um, so uh, I was a guest professor. That's going on my resume. Uh, uh, he, he also told Wade made a mistake here too and told me that I could talk about whatever I wanted to because he didn't have anything in mind specifically for me to talk about. Uh, so he said, just talk about whatever you feel like. That's dangerous. But I, I found myself, because this class is a little bit more on the practical side of youth ministry. Most youth ministry classes you take in Bible college are about the theory and how to approach and that sort of thing. But his class is more about the practical day in and day out stuff of youth ministry. And so I found myself thinking along the lines of, if I could go back, knowing what I know now, and tell myself at their age what I wish I knew, what would I say? Essentially, I approached it as if 35-year-old Brandon could go back and tell 22-year-old Brandon some things about ministry. What would those things be? And it, it led me to making out a list of different things. And that list grew to about 40 different important lessons that I've learned in the field of youth ministry. Now, again, that sounds way more impressive than what it actually was because one of those points was grow out your beard. Um, you'd be amazed. Anyway, uh, so... I was going through the class with them, and I was, I was making my way through that list, and we came to a point where I talked about an unfortunate side of ministry that you have to deal with, and that was, how do you approach people who are overly critical of you and your ministry? Ministry, by and large, is, tends to be a profession where we face criticism on a regular basis, but it seems like, at least in my opinion, particularly in youth ministry, you face criticism on a whole other level, because you've not only got criticism from members of the church, you've got criticism from parents, you've got criticism from your senior minister. You deal with a lot of criticism in the field of youth ministry. I really hope JT isn't watching this right now. But <laughs> I found myself, as I was going through that point, just kind of off the cuff, I said something along the lines of, no matter what you do in youth ministry, no matter how well you do your job, you're going to face people who are going to be very harsh, people who don't think the church needs you. And it's not because they don't like you. It's not because you're bad at your job. It's simply because they have no idea what it is that you do, and they're not about to try to find out. As I finished the class and, and everything was over, I, I found myself reflecting on the things that we had discussed. And I found myself wondering, wow, where did that come from? Because I didn't intend to say anything like that. I just, I didn't, it just kind of came out of my mouth. But as I was thinking more about it, I, I had flashbacks to times in my life where I faced criticism about what I was doing in the youth ministry from people who never set foot in my ministry, who did not have children in my ministry, who did not have grandchildren in my ministry. People who just seemed to criticize me for the sake of criticizing me. And, and what really stuck out in my mind is that a lot of the times when I faced criticism from people who were no, in no way, shape, or form involved in what I was doing in ministry, a lot more times than I was comfortable with, they were people in leadership positions, elders, deacons, other important members of the church who were, said some very harsh things to me, 
but never once showed up to anything that I was doing who didn't seem to be involved in what I was doing. I was told one time in a, a elders meeting that my job was essentially just to keep the kids entertained while they did far more important things in big church. I was told by an elder that I shouldn't have volunteers helping me out in the children's ministry because we hired you to do that job. Ironically enough, when I left that church, that children's ministry fell apart. It's funny how that happened. When I had students uh, uh, repetitively throughout my ministry, when I had students who demonstrated a, a heartfelt desire to serve their church because they loved it and they wanted to do something more involved in it, something, nothing like you know, coming up with a sermon or anything like that, but just simple, simple things like handing out bulletins or helping prepare the communion, I was told they're not mature enough for that. I mean, I don't know what kind of level of maturity it takes to say good morning and hand a bulletin to somebody, but whatever, not my call. But I know for a fact that I am not the only person who's ever done youth ministry and faced these sorts of things. In fact, every youth minister that I've ever known, if they've been involved in youth ministry for at least two months, they probably have a similar story to tell. Of people who say these things and yet aren't involved in any level in the youth ministry, aren't involved in what's going on in the kids. A great many churches are more than happy to bring on a youth minister or somebody to work with the students, but they give the impression that it's so that they can keep the kids out of everybody else's hair. A lot of churches give the impression that they have a mindset that children are to be neither seen nor heard in church. There are so many churches and church members who don't really care about what's going on in the lives of the students that are growing up among them, who don't take an interest in their spiritual development, who don't take an interest in their relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to have children's ministry programs, we want to have student ministry programs, but we just don't really care what's going on inside of them. They're the church of the future, we're the church now. I believe that we're starting to see some of the results of what I call devaluing our students and our children. There's some pretty recent statistics that I find absolutely terrifying. I say something like 66% of kids who grew up in the church, who were involved in children's and student ministries, will leave the church before the age of 22. Just as they are aging out of those student ministry programs, those youth programs that we have in place for them, you can almost set your watch to it how long you're going to have them on board. When they age out of these programs, they don't have any built-in relationships with anybody else in the church. They've spent the last several years of their lives where the only people who seem to show any interest in them as a human being or in their spiritual development was a youth minister and maybe a volunteer or two. So when they age out of those programs and they don't have that deep-rooted connection with anybody else in the church, they don't feel like they have a place. They wonder if the church is for them anymore because nobody seemed to take an interest for 18 years. I don't think this, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think this sort of thing is intentional. I don't think we mean to do this sort of thing. In fact, I choose to believe that we are very well intentioned in, in hiring youth ministers to handle children and student programs because it is vitally important to share the word of God with kids at their level. Right? There are some things that we talk about in this room that they're just frankly not ready for, that they've not experienced, that they haven't faced yet, and so they won't understand it. And so we need those programs. This is not an indictment on students and youth programs because I spent a long time in my adult life doing those. The issue is, is that as the church, we have given these kids the impression that that over there is for them. Just keep them out of our hair. And so students, by and large, are mass exiting the church because they don't feel like people care. It's become far too easy, I think, for us as the church to kind of forget the kids are there. I mean, they exit our room and, and we don't think much more about them until, unless you're a parent and you have to go pick them up, or a grandparent who brought their grandchild and you've got to go pick them up afterwards. We don't tend to think of them while we're in this room. We don't ask the question, what's going on up there? 
What are they doing? What are they learning? How much sugar are they having? You know, that's a question that always goes through my mind, at least. And, and it's kind of natural for us as human beings to kind of downplay what kids can and can't do and where they should and shouldn't be. And that's a, a thing that every parent from the first ones have wrestled with, including the father standing in front of you today. We have these, these things where we just don't really feel like the kids can be involved because we think they might mess things up or they might disrupt what's going on around us. This is something that's happened forever. It's been a problem, I would say, in the church since the church got founded. In fact, it's the crux of our text today. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. If you've got a Bible, open it up to it. This is a story you are likely at least vaguely familiar with. But it's also another one of those blink and you miss it texts. Things that we love to go through, or at least I love to go through, these blink and you miss it stories. It's in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. Let's read it together. It says, people were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And after taking them in his arms, he laid his hands on them and blessed them. Kind of some context of what's going on here. This is as Jesus' popularity amongst the nation of Israel is really starting to take off. Everywhere he's going, people want to be around him. They want to hear from him. They want to see what he's going to do. They, they're in awe of all the things that he's accomplished thus far. And so when Jesus is in this particular town, people are flocking to see him. But in this particular day, at this particular place, there's a special group of people who are hoping to meet Jesus. Some parents or siblings or other folks involved bring some small children to Jesus. And, and Mark gives us the, in, the indication that these are some fairly small children. So it's, it's probably a good thing to guess that they're probably no more than five, maybe six years old. At least the oldest of them. They're, they're little tykes, they're, they're toddlers, they're babies. And they're bringing them to Jesus in the hopes that they can meet him. This sort of thing isn't uncommon at this particular time period. In fact, it was kind of common practice that if you had a child and somebody important, like a rabbi or a teacher, was coming into town, you would bring your kid with you in the hopes that maybe that important person would place a hand on that child and maybe pray a blessing over them. It was a huge point of pride for parents to be able to say, my kid was prayed over by him. If we wanted to kind of give it a modern-day parallel This is kind of along the lines of those politicians kissing babies sort of things, or even like, you know, you might see occasionally on social media parents having their kids pose with their favorite celebrity or whoever else. It's a cool thing to have happen, and so as Jesus' popularity has begun to take off in this area, parents and siblings are, are bringing littles to come and meet Jesus in the hopes that maybe Jesus, maybe Jesus will just spend a little time with them. Maybe he'll just pray a blessing over top of them. It's a huge thing for them as a parent. They're they're really hoping that this will happen because this is something significant that can happen in the life of their kids. But not everybody's really happy to see a bunch of kids coming up. In fact, the disciples, Jesus' closest followers, don't just go so far as to say, hey, you're not welcome here. The text actually says, at the end of verse 13, it says, they rebuked them. And we talked about that word rebuke a couple of weeks ago, at the notion that it is a little bit more than just expressing your displeasure, that it is almost a visceral reaction. It is something that involves yelling and involves screaming. The disciples see these parents and siblings bringing these kids to Jesus and think, what are you doing? Why are you bringing them here? What makes you, this is not a place for kids. What makes you think Jesus has got time for your snot-nosed little brat? I don't think the disciples are intending to be malicious here. I don't think that's their their call here. I think what's going on here 
as the disciples believe wholeheartedly that the things that Jesus has to tell these folks are important. That the message that Jesus has come to deliver to this town is something that they desperately need to hear. And let's be honest, sometimes small children, as cute as they might be, can be distracting. If I'm up here preaching and all of a sudden we hear a baby crying in the room, am I keeping your attention? Probably not. It's kind of one of those fun things as a speaker, whenever a baby starts crying, you see every eyeball just goes straight over to that baby. It's kind of fun from my perspective because, you know, because I can see it all. Anyway, <laughs> but that's the case. Is that, so the disciples think that if these kids are coming around here, what if one of them starts crying or what if they break something or what if they do something that's going to disrupt what Jesus is doing? What he's got to say is important. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. We need to hear from him, and we can't have these kids here running a distraction. you got to get them out of here. Jesus sees what's going on. He kind of looks over, and, and Mark uses a really interesting word here to describe Jesus' reaction. He says that Jesus was indignant. That's a fun word. I don't know if you have look up vocabulary or stuff like that. Sometimes it's fun to just kind of pause and look at a specific word. Jesus is more than just a little irritated. He's more than just a little disappointed. He's angry. He's become indignant to this whole situation. He's flustered. He's upset. And Jesus is not upset at these parents or these siblings for daring to bring their small children before him. He's upset at his disciples. He's upset at the guys who should know better. He becomes so indignant, in fact, that he tells them in the rest of verse 14, he says, do not stop them. Let the little children come to me. Don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He's not upset at the people bringing the kids. He's upset at the way his disciples have responded to that. He's upset at the way his disciples are trying to stop them. This is, again, one of those places that we talked about just a couple of weeks ago where there are occasions in Scripture. And I love the fact that the, the, the disciples had a heavy influence in writing the Gospels. They could have not included these things, but they included moments like these where their priorities and Jesus's were not in line with each other. The disciples are willing to admit, hey, you know what, there's some places we got it wrong. Because this is a moment like we talked about just a few weeks back when we started this series that, that the disciples fired off some sort of a reaction. They assumed that Jesus didn't want these kids here. It is amazing, amazing how, much, how many times we get it wrong when we assume how Jesus would respond. They've assumed that Jesus doesn't want these kids around and Jesus is telling them, no, 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 no. That is not how it is. Don't stop them. Bring them on. I love that. Jesus sees these small kids. His heart just melts. He loves them. He wants to be around them. He wants to take some time with them. And he's telling his disciples, don't stop them. But it's that second part in verse 14 that kind of strikes me a little bit, right? Jesus says, don't stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. In verse 15, he elaborates a little bit further. He, he says that, that uh, hold on, I lost my place. <laughs> in verse 15, he says, truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Now, when we see this particular verse, we, our natural tendency is to think that Jesus is talking about our faith level, right? Like it's our ability to believe in him and what he has to say. Because let's face it, little kids will believe anything you tell them. You tell a four-year-old you've been to the moon, their eyes are going to get big. Really? It's one of the coolest things about kids is that they'll just believe wholeheartedly anything. But I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. See, because Jesus uses a word. He says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like one of these. How do little kids receive things? They just kind of take it as it is, right? Kids are, are, are naturally dependent. 
right? You and I have a, have a problem with dependence. We want to be independent people. We want to be able to take care of ourselves, to be on our own, to handle our own situations. But children, well, they can't, and it doesn't seem to bother them. Whenever my daughters and I, we go to the grocery store together, I, I, it's, it's sometimes very stressful to take them to the store with me, if I can be real with you. But once we go to the store and we've, we've picked up our items or whatever it is, and we'll go to the checkout, the cashier will always say, here's your total, you know, 1967. And then I'll just kind of elbow Robin or Adrian, one or the other, and just say, she said 1967, you going to get this? And they always respond the same way. They get a big grin on their face like, Dad! I live for that reaction, to be honest with you. It's fantastic. But they know for a fact that I'm going to take care of it. Whatever it is, whether it's food or something for the house or whatever it is that we need as a family, they know I got it. They don't have a problem living off of their mother and I's hard work. And that's okay. Because I love them. I care for them. They, they don't have to do anything to deserve whatever it is that we're doing at that particular time. They don't have to deserve clothes on their back. They don't have to deserve a roof over their head. They don't have to deserve the food that we put on the table. They just get it because we love them. And the kingdom of God is like that. Jesus tells us that there's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to deserve it. You have to receive it that way. You can't earn it. And isn't that something that we all struggle with constantly? It continues to be one of the biggest hurdles of our faith that we feel like we have to earn it on some level, like we have to be worthy of God's love and his devotion and his kingdom. And yet Jesus uses these kids in this particular moment to say, you know what, no, you, you got to be more like them. Because they don't feel like they have to earn it, they just accept it. Because that's the way the kingdom of God is. It's amazing how, how Jesus uses these, these kids around him to teach something more important. He points out that while you and I could teach these children a whole lot, we could still learn a thing or two from them. He loves these kids. He loves being around them. It's not the only time that he's ever used children to express his illustration. In fact, we don't have to go that far. We can just go back a few verses in Mark chapter 9, verses 36 and 37. Jesus takes a child up in his arms and he tells his disciples, whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. Kids matter to Jesus. We sing songs when we were little that Jesus loves the little children. Maybe we need to sing that as adults too. To remind ourselves that Jesus loves them. That he cares for them. That he has time for them. That they have a place with him and they have a role to play in his church. After Jesus finishes correcting his disciples' priorities and and stresses the importance and the acceptance of kids, he does more than just place a hand on and pray for these kids. It's a beautiful moment, actually, in verse 16. He says that he, he not only did all those things, but he didn't do those until after taking them in his arms. Can you imagine getting a hug from Jesus? I, I consider myself a pretty good hugger, I think Jesus has got me beat. He's so excited to be around them that he has to embrace them, to scoop them up in his arms, to play with them a little, and then pray a special blessing over top of them. It's more than any parent or sibling hoped for in that day because Jesus loves these kids. He has a heart for them. He has a desire to have a relationship with them. They're important to him. Not just when they're older, when they know better, when we think they're ready, they're important to him now. And so as his church, how can we treat children any differently? How can we possibly give them the impression that they don't matter? I'm not suggesting that we get rid of ministries that are specifically for kids. Far from it. Again, I'm a firm believer that children's ministries and student ministries are a vital, vital part of the church. Because it's important to teach those kids the word of God at their level. Right? They don't understand certain words. They wouldn't understand the word indignant if I explained it to them. 
My daughters would still try to use it in a sentence, but they wouldn't understand it. It's kind of adorable when that happens. But they're not ready to understand that sort of stuff, so we need to teach them the Word of God at their level to make them prepared to slowly build on that foundational knowledge, to begin to give them a faith that's enriched in them. But again, the problem isn't offering, in these, offering these programs. The issue is offering these programs and then disconnecting ourselves from the kids entirely. To not take an interest in what's going on. To not take an interest in what's happening in the church around us. Even if we feel that they're the church of the future, don't you think we ought to know what's going on? So that we can ensure ourselves that the future is bright for the church? I don't know about you, but I'm hoping this church thrives long after I'm dead and gone. And that's going to happen when we take an interest in what's going on in the kids around us. I'm not suggesting everybody in here needs to come on and volunteer in the children's ministry or the youth ministry. I said that a few weeks ago. I still say it today because I mean it. Some of you just aren't gifted in that realm. You're not equipped to handle what all goes on. You are not ready for junior high girls. You're just not. And you may end up doing more harm than good. I'm not suggesting that that's the case, but I think it's important that you and I both look for ways to encourage our kids, to be involved in what's going on, to just at least have some understanding of what's happening, to figure out what, what are they learning, what are they doing, what it's, what's going on upstairs, what's going on downstairs on Wednesday nights, what's happening amongst our kids. I mentioned beforehand that roughly 66% of kids raised in the church end up leaving it, but that number greatly decreases, greatly decreases when two to even one person who is not their parent, who is not their youth minister, and who is not connected to the youth ministry takes an interest in them, who cares about them, who talks to them who remembers their name. I can't tell you how much it means to a kid when somebody who is not related to them in any way, shape, or form not only remembers their name, but spends just talking about the importance for us as those who are older in the church to take an interest, to be invested, to pour into what's going on in the lives of those behind us. What, what do you think would happen if, if we stopped looking at the kids in our church as the future and instead we started treating them like the church of today? What if we actively looked for ways for our students and our children to be involved in what is going on in the life of the church, to be active and in, in to find them someplace to serve? I'm going to tell you these kids care about the church just as much as you do. They care about this place just as much as you and I do. They love this place. They're concerned about its future, just like you and I are. So what do you think would happen if, if we were to take an investment in, into them? If we were more than just encouraging to our new incoming youth minister, but we were encouraging to our kids as well? I think it just might change everything. I think we'd see that number 66%. We'd see that drastically drop. And instead, we would raise up kids who are invested in what's going on. We'd raise up kids who care about their church, who want to be involved, who have a servant's heart behind them. What's more is, is think about the things that they may be able to accomplish when they're our age. What I'm talking about today is giving our children, our students, a leg up over what you and I have had. Is that not what every parent wants for their kids? To give them something better than what they had before them? If we as the church can invest and encourage our students, then by the time they reach our age, they're going to be miles ahead of where we are right now. They're going to be so far ahead spiritually. They're going to be giants in the faith. All because you and I took an interest. All because you and I decided, I'm going to care about what's going on. 
You never know how much of an impact you can have in the life of a child. In fact, they might just teach you a thing or two. Kids matter to Jesus. He loves them. He's invested in them. Because of that, they should matter to his church as well. As many of you know, over the past year, I've been kind of handling things in our youth ministry as we've been in between youth ministers. And I've got to be honest with you, I'm pretty grateful for that. Because it's given me a chance to get to know our students a lot sooner than I would have. Some of them are sitting over there, so I'm not going to look that direction or I might cry. So we have great kids. Sure, we don't have the biggest youth group in the world, that's fine. But the kids we got are awesome. They care about their church. They're just as concerned about it as you are. You ought to take some time to get to know them. Because they're awesome. What would happen if as the church we decided to invest in them, to pour into them, to care about them? I think we should encourage them to share their ideas, to share what they think we should be doing. And then, and here's the kicker, this is the hard part for us, try it. Is every idea going to work? No. Does every one of your ideas work? I, I, I can make you a list right now of ideas that I've tried that blew up in my face. How encouraging would it be if we just said, you know what, we're going to give that a shot. That's a great idea. Who knows how God could use them to change all of us for the better.